Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We turn in our hymnals now in our poetry unit number four, collection number two, to the last of the collection number uh, unit number two on page 665. This is the William Carlos Williams Spring and All text. Before we get there, though, just a reminder on 639. I hope you're looking at it with me for a moment. At 2B, remember, we're concentrating on the speaker of the poem, not always the poet himself or herself. We're also focusing on the distinctions between narrative poetry and lyric poetry. Put this in your notes at 2B. We're going to look at a classic example of lyrical poetry here, okay? Notice, the speaker shares thoughts, feelings, insights to create a single unified impression. In this case, it's going to be the impression about the amazingness of spring, okay? We'll get to it in a moment. We're also concentrating on reading fluently. It's my hope that as you work through these poems with me, you're starting to learn how to read poetry a little bit better, especially in regards to adjusting your reading rate, as we see on page 639. Finally, uh, the, I, the issue of tone and what it is that we're looking at when we look at tone. Real briefly on 656, just to remind the vocabulary you need to study there on 657, let's uh, introduce ourselves to William Carlos Williams, who, by the way, you will see again in your junior year because he's considered one of America's greatest poets, especially Red Wheelbarrow. Write that down at 3A. That's his most famous poem, arguably. And you may want to take a look at it. You can see my lecture at LearnStrong.net if you're interested in the junior folder on that one. 1883 to 1963 is your dates. Um, he was both a doctor and a poet. So, whoa, write that down. So William Carlos Williams is a doctor, but he also writes poetry. When asked how he managed his double career, he replied that he treated his patients like poems and his poems like patients. Isn't that an amazing line? I mean, take, take, think about what that means, right? I think of my patients like my poetry. I think of my poetry like my patients. Williams also said that a poet should, quote, listen to the language of his locality. In other words, stay attentive. Be a good listener. Can we say this? And we haven't probably said this yet. Good writers and good poets are, by definition, good listeners. Let's write that down. Good listeners. That is to say, they look at the world through eyes of attention, of curiosity, wonder, and they somehow seek to try and translate that. Let's talk about the essence of this poem. Spring, one of our four seasons, and of course where we live, we enjoy all four seasons with a certain kind of gusto, do we not? Think of it. You have your beginning of your school year, the fall, which takes place for a while, and then you move into the winter. Out of the winter comes your spring, and then, of course, finally, your summer. You guys, through 11, uh, 10 years now, soon to be 11 years, have thought about your years, interestingly, not really beginning in January. Have you noticed this? For you guys, everybody who's an adult makes a big deal about the 1st of January and the beginning of the new year. But truly, your first of the year is not January the 1st. Your first of the year is the end of August, 1st of September. Why? Because for 10 years, that's been the beginning of school. And for you guys, think of it, everything is driven by school, right? You begin in the fall. And so that's really your first quote-unquote season of the year. Then you go through that wretched long winter, unless of course you enjoy winter and snowboarding and the like. And you come out of that winter into spring and of course, all students will report their favorite time of the year is the last day of school, which always seems to happen in the same month, namely the month of May. Yes. And then finally, when May is out, summer begins, which is, of course, in most kids' minds, summer is that great freedom moment, the hundred days when I don't have to go to school and I can enjoy my life and nobody's telling me what to do all the time. Of course, by the sophomore year, we start picking up jobs through the 100 days of summer, and some of my students report they're happy when finally the junior year begins because they can actually get back to having a little bit of freedom because the summer has been all about working, and so they haven't had what they had for all those earlier years when they just had fun to be able to go do everything. Spring, the waking up time. Spring, the end of winter and the beginning of the waking up time. William Carlos Williams is interested in all of that. Now, pay attention to the way that the poem is divided up organizationally. Let's just follow along, read along, and let's just enjoy some of the observations that he, that he uh, makes about Spring and All. Spring and All by William Carlos Williams. By the road to the contagious hospital, under the surge of the blue mottled clouds driven from the northeast, a cold wind. Beyond, 
the waste of broad, muddy fields, brown with dried weeds, standing and fallen. Patches of standing water, the scattering of tall trees. All along the road, the reddish, purplish, forked, upstanding, twiggy stuff of bushes and small trees with dead brown leaves under them, leafless vines. 666. Lifeless in appearance, sluggish, dazed spring approaches. They enter the new world naked, cold, uncertain of all save that they enter. All about them the cold, familiar wind. Now the grass. Tomorrow, the stiff curl of wild carrot leaf. One by one, objects are defined. It quickens, clarity, outline of leaf. But now the stark dignity of entrance. Still, the profound change has come upon them. Rooted, they grip down and begin to awaken. Now, we'll obviously get, in this study of this poem, we obviously got to get to some grammar, no question. I love to teach you guys grammar bedded, embedded within a text. Instead of handing out to you just silly worksheets and saying, this is a pronoun, let me teach you about pronouns, we do a bunch of worksheets. It's a whole lot better, I think, to learn grammar within a text. So we're obviously going to have to ask about pronouns and their antecedents. Uh, don't worry, we'll get to it. But before we get there, let's just pay attention at level one to the opening of the poem. Notice, we have a sense of location. By the road, to the contagious hospital. What an interesting adjective, contagious, and the hospital, right? We think about hospitals as being the place where sick people go. Notice, it gives us a sense of place. Notice all of your prepositions. Every, anything a squirrel can do to the log. Under the log, around the log, through the log, by the log, etc., etc. Notice, we begin with a preposition, by the road, and then the second line, under the surge of the blue molted clouds. By the way, pay attention to all your colors in this poem. The molted clouds driven from the northeast, and then you got the dash. What's the point of the dash? Let's put it in 2B. What's the point of the dash? Gives us a pause, and then we're able to somehow fill in an idea or a concept. Notice, a cold wind. So in other words, let's stop at level one. First observation. We're still in the cold, which means we're still in the winter. Notice your title, spring and all. We're still in the winter, but there is maybe a bit of hope with the word beyond. Notice another preposition. Beyond the waste of broad, muddy fields. We have falling going on, possibly rain already starting to happen. Brown with dried weeds standing and fallen. In other words, the snow is melting off. And under the snow is all that dead stuff. Namely, of course, bushes, grass, trees. Notice then a break. But notice no punctuation. Hey, hey, hey. C-L-O-S-E. It's what we call close reading. C-L-O-S-E. I am challenging you to read very close. Did you notice no punctuation? at the end of the first stanza into the second stanza. Do you see it? Do you see it? Patches of standing water, the scattering of tall trees all along the road, the reddish, purplish, forked, upstanding. Do you see this list? What are we talking about? This is, cru this is crucial to, for the end of the poem. What are we talking about? Write it down at level one. What's he describing right now? The trees, right? He's describing trees in the spring. What do they look like? Well, they look kind of like naked. Why are they naked? Naked means without clothes, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it does. But if you're a tree that's naked in the spring, early spring, at the end of winter, it's because, of course, like we say about Ruthie's tree, right, that... By the end of winter, all of those leaves on Ruthie's tree are gone. So you just have the arms, the branches of the tree, without any kind of foliage, any kind of protection, we might say. All along the road, the reddish purple is forked, upstanding twiggy stuff of bushes and small trees with dead brown leaves under them, leafless vines, and then again the use of the dash. Hey, by the way, put it in 3A. You're going to see more of this dash when we study Emily Dickinson the great American poet, 
not only in our sophomore year, but also in our junior year. By the way, we saw her in our freshman year as well. Emily Dickinson, Much Madness is Divinest Sense to the Discerning Eye, we, uh, we messed with, and I think in our freshman year. We'll come back to it here uh, in our sophomore year, and then in our junior, we'll study Emily Dickinson again. Then we're on to page 666. Ironically, the page 666, the number of death, and, you, and, and obviously look at the first word at the top of that page. Lifeless in appearance. It's funny, isn't it, if you think about it? At the end of winter, I go out to Ruthie's tree. I have my chainsaw. All the leaves are gone off of it. I go, uh-oh, Ruthie's tree is dead. Ring, ding, 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 ding. Let's, let's, let's cut it down. And you come up and you go, no, no, no. <laughs> Don't cut down Ruthie's tree. That's like a really important tree for us in 303. And besides that, that tree ain't dead. What do you mean it ain't dead? Look at it. It's completely dead. It's not dead. It only looks dead. What do you mean it only looks dead? No, no, no. Here in just a few hours, all of a sudden, miraculously almost, little buds start happening on the end of those branches. And then all of a sudden, in a matter of days, it starts, well, let's read it. Lifeless to the appearance, sluggish, dazed spring approaches another dash. By the way, the word dazed is a great word, isn't it? Write it down at level one. What does it mean to talk about spring as dazed? Have you ever been almost knocked out? You're skateboarding, wham, you fall down, bang, you hit your head. You're like, whoa, 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 you're totally disoriented. And then all of a sudden you're like, dude, i got to sit down for a little bit because I'm not sure where I am. That's called dazed. In what ways is early spring dazed? Well, we're familiar with this where we live, right? Where, for example, all of a sudden the sun comes out, every, all the snow goes away. It's like, yay, spring is here. And then all of a sudden we get this huge blizzard. And then we're back again to it. It's like, wait a minute, I thought we were like having spring. What's going on? And then all of a sudden... All, all, uh, you know, uh, uh, melted off. Yay, yay, it's spring. Bam, back to another. In other words, dazed means uncertain. Coming out of winter, spring stumbles along, right? Spring approaches. And then, line 16. Now, we have rules in the English language. Watch this. We've studied this before, but I like to remind it to you. We do not have in English, that's silly to say it, we do not have eight parts of speech. That's silly, okay? If, if we have eight parts of speech, then the interjection, wow, is a part of speech. Wow is a part of speech. We know that, of course, we don't have eight parts of speech. In English, we have two parts of speech. We've said it before. We have something doing something. That is to say, we have a noun or a subject, something, doing something, some kind of action. We call it a verb or a predicate, yes? So that's what we call, qualifies the two parts of speech. But sometimes that thing in a sentence is fuzzy, unclear. So, for example, I will say to you, hey, hey, will you please give me that? And you go, I, I know you're talking about a thing, but what is it you want me to give? These fuzzy, unclear words, give me that. Isn't she amazing? Well, I don't know. Which she are we talking about? Isn't he hot? Well, I don't know. It just depends on the he we're talking about. And these are unclear words. These things, these subjects, we call fuzzy subjects, we call pronouns. We know we're talking about a thing, but we're not really clear which thing we're talking about. Right? So, for example, watch, I can play this game with you. They are the most annoying people I know. Okay, I know you're talking about a thing, a group of things, but like, what, which they? Like, who? That thing we're talking about that has to come before, anti, put it in your notes, at 2B. A-N-T-E, anti, that which comes before, antecedent, antecedent, that which comes before, the thing that comes before, Right? So, for example, if I'm talking to a whole bunch of my students who all have younger brothers and sisters, I can say to them, hey, you know what? Little brothers and sisters sometimes, they can really be annoying. Now you know who the they is. In other words, you know that the antecedent to the pronoun they is annoying brothers and sisters. So we have rules in the English language that are actually very, very simple. One of those major rules is you never use the pronoun until you have the antecedent provided. That way we have clarity, right? In other words, you say something about annoying little brothers and sisters, and then in that paragraph you refer to the word they. Poets love to disregard this rule. Take a look in our poem. Notice at line 16, they is capitalized. We're starting a new concept. 
They enter the new world naked, cold, uncertain of all save that they enter. They, who? They babies enter the world? They who? What is the antecedent to the pronoun they? And of course, if you've been paying close attention, you know he's talking about trees, right? There's a reason why we reference Ruthie's trees so regularly in 303. Poems like this obviously make us look out the window at that tree. Depending upon what time of the year I teach this poem, we obviously see that tree in a different light. If I'm in the fall, usually that tree is, is starting to lose its leaves. If we're in the early spring, late winter, early spring, we understand entirely what this means. How can a tree be naked? Well, it that doesn't have any of its leaves. Cold, uncertain of all save that they enter. In other words, they're still there. The trees that were there in October are still there in April. You got me? Okay. All about them, again, the antecedent trees. The cold, familiar wind. Notice again the dash. We're in the spring. We obviously still got the cold wind. Now, line 20, the grass. Tomorrow, the stiff curl of wild carrot leaf. So, notice we move from trees to, to leaves, to grass, right? The leaves of grass. We'll talk more about this when we meet Whitman next year as a junior in his um, Song of Myself. One by one, objects are defined, dash. It quickens. Wait a minute. It is another pronoun. It quickens. Like if I say to you, it drives me nuts. Does it drive you nuts? You're like, dude, I know you're talking about a thing, but I just don't know what that thing is you're talking about because you used a pronoun, it, and you didn't provide me with the antecedent. What it? It what drives you nuts? Notice here. It quickens clarity. What quickens clarity? outline of leaf. Well, we obviously realize we're talking about the title now. Spring. Spring quickens clarity. It brings. It's like, have you ever seen something like unfocused, and then all of a sudden you turn the lens a little bit and it starts to become focused? That's kind of like, he says, that's kind of what spring, spring does. Dignity of entrance. Notice the dash again. Still, the profound change has come upon them. We're back to the trees again, right? Rooted, they grip down and begin to awaken. Of course, the 3A right away, you can go back to the Denise Levertov poem that we worked with, A Tree Speaks of Orpheus, and the notion of the roots. Okay, so at level one, what are we working with? Simple, let's get through it now. Uh, this is a poem about the power of the change in dynamism of spring. 2A, major message here, everything is cyclical. Everything goes in cycles. You go from cold, negative, nasty winter, into spring, to summer, and then back again to fall. Everything is cyclical. That is the nature of your life. At 2B, we've got all kinds of symbolism going on here. What, is the, what do the trees symbolize for you? What does spring symbolize for you? Many will write down, spring represents or symbolizes rebirth, new growth. Like a baby that's just being born. When you were born, you were completely naked as you came to the world. Vulnerable. If, if somebody hadn't taken care of you, you would have died in those early hours. Immediately, you would have died. If somebody had just taken you and sat you somewhere for 12 hours, you'd have been dead. You'd have been dead. You would have never made it. Somebody had to appropriate for you. That's the nature of birth. At 3A, what is for you the, your favorite text about the spring? Hey, write this down. When you are a senior, you're going to come back to this, to this idea. That's why I'm having you write it down now. I'll remind you of it when you're a senior. The great poet, Percy Bysshe Shelley, wrote a famous poem called Ode to the West Wind, where the last line is this. If winter come, can spring be far behind? Question mark. If winter come, can spring be far behind? In other words, no matter how bad it gets, winter. No matter how bad it gets in your life, winter. There's always the spring. Never forget that. Because spring is all about hope. New life. New growth. Finally, at, 3A, at 3B, what is for you your favorite time of the year? Is it the fall? Autumn. Is it winter? Many of my students love winter, especially if they're outdoor enthusiasts in the winter. Christmas time is, of course, winter. Is it for you spring, as described by William Carlos Williams here, the time of new growth, new discovery, new life? Many of my students have said it makes sense that we do graduation in May, right at the 
springtime, when we're getting, it makes sense to get out of school for us at that time. Or is for you your favorite time of the year, summer, for all of the reasons that any sixth grader will tell you, because I don't have to do this wretchedness called school anymore. Well, spring and all, I hope you've enjoyed the study. And William Carlos Williams, maybe you'll go to find more of his poems. Thank you.